This meeting is being recorded. Yeah. So, um, so with that out of the way, this week is about uh, tokens and mechanism design. So incentives inform everything, as we see on point number five. And the personal principle is listen to and tell better stories. So, so with that simple intention, we are also launching this series called the Keeping It Simple series. We launched it yesterday with Clifton from Arbitrum, who is the DAO relations lead at Arbitrum. And we had a wonderful discussion on governance in Web3. Today we have Lisa and she will share on about many, many things related to crypto economics, as well as um, many things related to how we can create tokens for play and start thinking beyond tokens um, in the first place. So to start, to get things started, we'll have um, like a brief introduction to tokens. So as you might have seen in the announcement post, like this is one of my favorite things um, in kernel. Like when I saw this first in KB4 that a token uh, has the same root as the German word for teach. So tokens convey um, like the smallest meaningful unit of information and it's supposed to teach us about a fact. And this had a nice analogy with a computer science talk that Rich Hickey gave at one point, which said facts are values. And um, Andy, when Andy was writing the syllabus, um, like compared it with how everything in an Ethereum smart contract is a key value pair. Um, so it's about like conveying certain facts about certain things at a certain point of time. And when we move beyond the financial and towards the pro-social, we can see how tokens could solve two key web scale problems, which is discoverability and moderation. And we have Paul with us as well, who would go into both of those. And when we talk about the personal principle, like every office hours, we have been sharing this one principle, which is uh, around listening. And um, the key thing there is that the quality of listening always informs the quality of talking and good listeners li listen as a response and don't listen to respond. So this is one of the beautiful aspects mentioned in the uh, module this week and around incentives, um, like there's a whole section in the module which uh, describes what constitutes persuasive language. And that means words which perform what they say. So uh, we will go into incentive design quite a bit in this session as well, and how software can be used as service in order to serve society better and not use software as a service, uh, which has been the key theme of Web2 over the past decade. And we also look at what economic games do our contracts incentivize? What are the second and third order effects of those uh, economic games? And Paul will cover a bit of that. So there are some examples in the module around like Amazon, Lost Garden, um, to describe the concepts behind discoverability and moderation and the different values that they um, inculcate around friendship, thriving individuals, positive group norms, altruism, and shared goals. So with all these uh, wonderful concepts uh, described in this module, we'll delve into something more specific. So I'll hand it over to Paul, who has been with us since the Genesis blog, and um, he can share about his own experiences with like, game design and how it relates to uh, incentives, tokens, and mechanism design. So yeah, over to you, Paul. Ooh, thank you, Sid. Um, so I, I want to start by, I guess we're double clicking on that quote from Jonathan Blow, which is the overall goal is show a lot of truth with minimum contrivance. And um, and also I want to share with everyone why these are the slides, um, because in the, in the kernel syllabus, you kind of have a transition to game designers, right, in, in this part. And, uh, and there's a question there on why why are we talking about game design in tokenomics and incentive mechanism? And I do feel like it is a perfect place to start because uh, in terms of where game design and tokenomics are uh, similar, it's both designing new, in, new universes with rules and consequences for players. And um, and the game designers have been doing that uh, a, a bit longer than most. For example, you can kind of see a lot of tokenomics um, looking at MMOs, esports or mechanisms like loot boxes so it is kind of the perfect uh the, the perfect analogy for when you're looking at learning something from from something that's already been done i had a conversation with one of the kernel fellows uh, dean and one of the one quote that he told me that i remember is old problems uh need old solutions 
And I feel like here in, um, in Web3, there are some old problems that we try to find new solutions for. So one thing I like about, uh, can you go back a little bit, Sid, to the, yeah, so I'll, so the, so to talk a little bit about the, the slides here, the, so we have Jonathan Blow here, which is the, one of the most important game designers, I would say, during the, the early days when independent games were coming out. And he's, in his talk, he's demoing a game called Portal, which is, a which is at its core, a very simple game. It's just, you're able to put two portals across different places in space. And just with that simple mechanism, he he's able, the, the game developers of uh, of Portal were able to create like a very, very rich game. And and here he shares his uh, aesthetic for game design, which is to aim toward the richest space, explore it completely and trace a strong boundary around it. And, uh, and I think that's also something we can use in tokenomics, right? Like, as Sid said, like sometimes you need to find the simplest thing and then just explore that space and kind of see how you can create more riches around that. And we kind of see that mirrored all across design, right? Great design is subtraction. Like a lot of the times we are just adding contrivance upon contrivance. But if you look for, that, for a valuable truth, then that's something that you can build on. And next slide, please. Sid. Thank you. And the... Uh, to talk more about game designers, right? So this is another talk that's featured heavily in the kernel syllabus. And me personally, I found a lot of meaning in uh, in this talk by Brett Victor, Inventing on Principle, where he starts by saying, unlike the pre previous session, I don't have any prizes to give out. I'm just going to tell you how to live your life, which I love because it's like an inadvertent commentary on uh, tokenomics or incentives and uh, and meaningfulness. Uh, and, and he goes on to say like... Uh, like throughout his career, he's he's found a guiding principle, which is something you believe is important and necessary and right. And for him personally, it was creators need an immediate connection to what they create. And all his work was focused on how to make that better for creators. And we see that now that it, that's not really what's uh, what's happening in creation. Like when you're coding, as he's showing here, um, like creating code, like programming is so much different from just making something that you want to happen. So Sid mentioned around second order, third order effects, right? Like it's 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 not so easy for us, for example, to create smart contracts and have them behave the way we want. So there are better ways to do that. And and Brett, Brett's uh, principle in making his work is, is really focused on that. Um, and I think um, what's also important is in both presentations, both games uh, game designers found a kernel of truth in their work, which is ap applicable not only in other fields, but in general design, right? And I kind of want to connect it now as a, to a broader context in tokenomics. Uh, as a game designer myself, I've been making games for about 20 years. I've seen, uh, I've seen games change uh, all throughout a time when, when new technologies come out or when new ideas come out. Um, and as a perfect example, when those two game designers were coming up, right, there were new platforms and new technologies that were affecting their work, like uh, app stores, social networks, as I mentioned, touch screens. Um, and that kind of changed how they designed games. Also, the, the tools and language that they use changed. So when, when I was making games before, we didn't use the, uh, terms like funnels and pyramids or game loops. And that just came around because of the platforms and the, and the technologies that were coming in. So our language changed from mostly around narrative and um, and I would say like mechanics to more social, more marketing based uh, uh, terms like um, like DAOs, the AU, D1, D7, D30. Like that's how long a player will play your game, conversion, engagement, how long before they pay for a game, and then. Mechanisms diverge into soft and hard currency. Soft currency is currency that's earned without any sort of uh, actual fiat currency coming into the economy. And so that this that defined how games were designed, and that's led to how how our games look like today. And and con and also like in in Web three, we we see the same thing happening, right? Like a lot of the a lot of the terms are still just being defined. Uh, I was there at the time when NFTs weren't a, a term. Like we were also trying to make to to define that term. Like crypto items was the, the term that we ourselves were coining. Then NFT kind of became, I guess, the probability space kind of uh, converged on NFT as the term. 
And now we see other terms like we'll talk about today, like floor price, market cap, price action, tokens, incentives. And I guess I also want to be mindful of how these words that we use define the space, right? When we say FOMO, ape in, do your own research, not going to make it wreck. But that kind of gives us a specific spirit to the space. So be also mindful of the language we use. And yeah, and as a last point, I, I want to bring it back to to the game designers again. So one thing that Andy and I were looking at while we were um, chatting about this module was um, was a conference called Project Horseshoe. So around 2018, a lot of game designers kind of realized that the, the industry wasn't in a good space. A lot of it was um, very toxic. Um, a lot of it was very focused around in-app transactions, ads. And so they created this conference, which was designed to solve game design's toughest problems. And um, one one quote there that I put quote that, that I put also was uh, something I heard from a podcast by um, John Fabro of Pod Saves America, where he was chatting with Kara Swisher around Silicon Valley and how that changed. Um, he said that technology was created before to solve a problem. Now technology is the problem, right? Like we we kind of see people are more. Um, uh, want to uh, retreat in their cozy spaces because the the technology space sometimes can be so toxic, and and so I want to end with um, just thinking of what are our guiding principles when we're designing these systems. Uh, are we finding the valuable truths, or is it a bit contrived? And and I want to end with what Kurt Vonnegut says, which I I feel also is part of my guiding principle, and. And in, in, in he says that, what should young people do with their lives today? Many things, obviously, but the most daring thing is to create stable communities in which the terrible disease of loneliness can be cured. And he said this back in 1974, and now, like 50 years later, right? It's still prescient. It's just something that is important to, to all of us. And so, yeah, I think that's a, that's a hopefully that's a good uh, intro to, to when we talk about crypto economics and just uh, hopefully it guides us in our discussions. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Paul. That was a wonderful introduction to pro-social game design. And like, who else to better talk about like how like, how can we move beyond tokens and mecha mechanism design than Lisa herself? So just to briefly introduce Lisa, um, like Lisa has written the book on economics design, the uh, economics design framework, which we will go into um, briefly today. Um, but uh, like um, like more relevant, a more relevant thing would be that she is giving a talk very soon at ETH Denver on tokens for play, which um, kind of, um, which is something we'll touch upon a bit as well. And how like the concepts that Paul just mentioned, how can they um, be reflected in the economies and societies that we create? So um, like Lisa, like whenever you're ready, we can start with discussing about what are your thoughts on tokens, mechanism design, like like the whole concept of Ikigai, which Lisa's website like very wonderfully describes and I've applied it to my life as well. And just the relevance of economics um, in, in the projects that we create. So yeah. welcome, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Fit. Thank you everyone for, for joining. I, I can talk about this for days and, and hours at a time. So I'm just trying, trying to be mindful and condense this to a little bit more like a 20, 25 minutes. We have some space for questions ask questions, any clarifications, you know, open for discussions. I'll be honest with you, I don't have all the answers in the world. A lot of things are still evolving, but I'll share with you as much as I have understood, I have learned and I've experienced. So before that, a show of hands, you can just use the emoji to reply. How many of you are working on a token project? Whether you're a layer one, layer two, um, DeFi, DEX, GameFi. Okay, good amount of people. And how many of you are thinking of creating a project? Maybe it's another emoji that gets confusing. Okay, okay, good amount of people. Okay, great. And how many of you are just here to learn and just absorb knowledge like a sponge, just to understand how to approach this moving forward and you know try to jump on the bandwagon and you know not, not be left behind? Okay, good amount, good amount, great. All right, so I'm gonna preface this with this topic. I can go in three different ways, but I want to focus on two of them. But you know, feel free to ask questions. So the first thing I want to talk about, I love that Paul and Sid gave a very, very comprehensive introduction 
And we look at games because games are something that's not new. Games, are, games have been around for like 10, 20 years, very sophisticated design, sophisticated economic building. And so it's nothing new, genuinely nothing new. The only thing that Web3 brings about is the ability to trade these assets in the secondary market and create a whole new market ecosystem. But the core fundamentals, the core principles do not, just doesn't change at all. So I love that games was an introduction to give you guys some, some ideas. So there's three ways you can talk about this. The first one is how do we measure economy? You know, we have TBL, market cap, FDV. Are they good measures? Are they bad measures? Are they good measures for what reasons? They're bad measures for what reasons? What will be a better way to understand how to measure value created in this industry? That's one. The second thing I want to talk about on topics two and three is if you look at a life cycle of a project, you go from zero to hundred. Zero to one is if zero is where you have an idea of paper. One is where you have, you know, your MVP, your POC, your product market fit, your first users. And then 100 is where you go IPO, your series DEF kind of fundraise, and you have a very good traction of growth and you dominate the market space. So as we, when we're talking about economics, we're not just limiting to a zero to one phase, you know, where you have ideas on paper and how do you create a, pro a protocol, a project. When we think of tokenomics, we think of economics, we have to think about the entire life cycle from zero to how do you dominate the market space. I'm not saying that every project needs to dominate the market space. I'm just thinking, this is the site that we're setting for. If we want to get the 1 billion users, if we want to really make a change in the world, if we're making a public good, that's the level 100. So when you think of economics, it's not just, what is the short term or midterm? How do I go to market? How do I pump the token? How do I launch the token? But what does it look like when it becomes a public good? What does it look like when it becomes a big protocol that people use? So in this case, I would like to divide two, topics two and three into two components. One is zero to one, one is one to 100. The economic, the, the lens of economics, or the way we look at economics in these zero to one phase and one to hundred phase, is slightly different, and I can dive more into that. But because we're all in this, you know, we're learning about economics. We want to understand the fundamentals. We want to get our core principles right. On, I want to link to the previous kernel sessions that you have done, understanding what's tokens, understanding, you know, the various high principles and economic principles. I want to focus on the zero to one phase. But I will give a little teaser to look at how do you move towards from 1 to 100. So that in mind, that sets the stone. And I want to dive deeper into what I want to talk about. The main thing I want to talk about today is, number one, how do we, what's the core principle of economics? What if the thing about in economics? How is Web2 economics different from Web3 economics? How do we go about understanding, designing economics from a framework perspective? And number two is, great, we've got an economics in place. Happy days. No, it's not. It's not enough. How do we link economics to business model? How do we link economics to product design? So that's a phase two that I want to talk about. So let's begin with economics. And at the end of the day, you know, I came into this space because I saw that there's a big difference between Web2 economics and Web3 economics. And the core principles, the first principles that's very, very different is in two folds. It's coordination and collaboration. In the Web2 space, it's all top down. This is the Facebook's terms and conditions. This is Google's terms and conditions. This is what Elon Musk says and Twitter executes. This is what the government says that you're, you're born in. You're defined by these jurisdictions that you're, you're born in. The future that I, I foresee and the future that I want to live in, it's ground up ecosystems. It's community-based ecosystems. Anyone gets to come into this ecosystem. Anyone gets to transact with anyone in this ecosystem. Anyone gets to transact different kind of assets. NFTs, tokens, non-tokens, doesn't matter. You get to transact physical goods in this ecosystem. So the main difference between Web2 and Web3 is, is coordination and collaboration. How do I, if I'm looking for a community-based approach, a community-created ecosystem, how do I create, how do I allow coordination and collaboration between different economic agents, different individuals, to build this ecosystem that we all agree by, and we all go govern this together, we build this public good toward, public good towards a public utility that benefits the, the mass majority. So that's the, that's the concept. And how, we, how do we do that? We do that in three different pillars, just as Sid has shown over there. And this is the economics design framework. What we want to do over here, the main goal, what does success look like, right? Because at the end of the day, we're, we're business people. We have to think about what success looks like and, and understand how do we design from, from that and goal in mind. The, the success is, is understanding what does a minimum viable economy look like? How do we go from an idea on paper to a minimum viable economy that I can test for product market fit and I can get users? That's why I'm, I'm not saying that here you have to do insane agent-based modeling. I would love to do that. But time is of essence over here as well. We can't spend all our time, can't spend three months building this beautiful, sophisticated agent-based model to test something out when we, we need real humans to test that out. 
So this this pillars this pillars in a very very simple straightforward manner. The first one is understanding the market. Again, because we instead of defining you know you being born in this country, you you have this nationality because of this ju- physical jurisdiction that you are born in. You you are in this market. I'm born in Singapore, so I'm a Singaporean. I am subscribed to the Singapore market. Born in somewhere else, wherever it doesn't matter. So the important thing over here is to understand who is in the market. Again, we're creating ecosystems from ground up. So we need to understand who is in the market, who gets to transact in the market, who gets to participate in the market. This is not any discrimination thing at all, because the thing is, in crypto, everyone gets to move in and out of the market very freely. So it does, it does not matter. What we do as designers is to understand, if I'm building an economy, if I'm building rules of the economy, if I'm building the, the design of the tokens, I need to understand which is the ecosystem, the environment that people will exist in, that tokens will exist in, and tokens will be trading with it. I'm not talking about the Binance and, and CFI ecosystem and centralized exchange because that's a, a very short-term trade. I'm talking about how do people come together to collect, collaborate and coordinate within, within each other to really generate long-term value. That's very, very important. Understand, understanding who gets to come and participate in this ecosystem and what kind of transactional pathways they are going to create. How do you increase thickness of ecosystem? How do you increase more users coming in? How do you make it how do you resolve congestion issues to allow people to trade and transact with each other? Because again, coordination and collaboration, they need to interact. How do you reduce that congestion structure? What, what could cause congestion in the first place? And all these different things about how do you create this market structure? So that's the absolutely macro perspective. You know, Creating an ecosystem, sure, happy days. We want to define that. But how do you really realistically understand that? It's who gets to participate in the ecosystem? Who gets to come into the ecosystem? And what do they get to do? That's why I call transactional pathway. Do they get to govern? Is do they get to just access services provided? Do they get to use the the facilities involved? So are you layer one, layer two? Or you get the facilities involved, which is the validation of data and transactions? Or are you are you part of the product? Are you a consumer and, and you we're, we're productizing users in the space? So market design. Second thing, we go one level down, it's mechanism design. And the mechanism design, over here, we're understanding what are the rules and incentives in place. Very specifically, incentives to get people to behave in a certain way. At the end of the day, as much as we want to believe in effective altruism, there is no such thing as people just want to provide. The butcher doesn't give you meat because he doesn't want you to go hungry. A butcher doesn't sell you meat because he doesn't want you to be anorexic. A butcher sells you meat because he's intensifies to get money from you and feed his family. That's it, full stop. The truth is people are incentivized to do different kinds of things. People do different kinds of things because they're incentivized to do so. What we want to do in this ecosystem that we're building, we're creating, really define the market. What we want to, what we want to create then is the incentives to get people to behave in a certain way. So here we need to understand what are behaviors that we want to incentivize and what are the behaviors we want to disincentivize. And this, this part, very specifically, mechanism design is exactly why you can't just copy and paste economics from another protocol. You could be a hyper casual game. You could be an MMORPG game. You could be a strategy game. You could be a DeFi protocol. But what is an, an activity and a behavior or user behavior that's, that you want to incentivize versus business incentivize could be very different or even slightly different from a, a different ecosystem. And when we are taking and copy pasting the token design, you're copy pasting the incentives to drive user behaviors at the same time. And that's why it's, it's really difficult to just copy paste ecosystems because the, inse- the behavior you want to incentivize, the core principles, the first principles are different. All the other incentives will be quite different as well. So talk about market, who gets to participate in this market. Number two, we talk about the rules, the rules of how they participate in the market, the rules of, of how or the incentives and disincentives to guide their actions. And lastly, and finally, we talk about tokens. What are tokens in the first place? I know we have a kernel session about tokens. In its very, very, very core, tokens are something that captures value. And I know we talk about value in one of the kernel sessions. Value here can be extrinsic value. So it could be market value, trade value, secondary market value, centralized exchange value. What could be intrinsic value? Intrinsic value to make you want to stay in this ecosystem. Intrinsic value in terms of reputation of how you signal who you are in your ecosystem. Or any intrinsic value, maybe ease of use, ease of connecting with someone in your ecosystem. A token is anything that represents value. What we want to do is to extract, is to surface this value up, tokenize it, whether we trade it, not trade it, we, it's fungible, non-fungible, 
it does not matter. Anything that can be a that represents value can be a token, and we can decide if we want to trade it or not later down. The road. So when we're designing an ecosystem, we're looking at macro to micro perspective. The macro one is who's in the market. The middle is what are the rules that they need to abide by in this market? What are the incentives and disincentives? And lastly, token. What are these assets that they're trading? What is this value that we're talking about? When people come together, when they're coordinating, collaborating, that's the most important thing. They're coming together to generate value, to create value. Whether the value is short-term or long-term, it's, it's not the topic we're talking about right now, but they are coming together to create value. A reputational value, tradable value, non-tradable value, and a fungible value. We capture that in a token, and then we can figure out how to design this ecosystem better. Token setting up today in a Web3 setting is a brand new asset in this space. And so I want to I want to dive deeper into figuring out how we understand tokens. So I covered the first part of this economic design framework, right? Look at market mechanism and token design to go and create this ecosystem. Now, it's still very theory based. Ideally, we want to start from the market, who, who comes into our ecosystem, and then how do we design tokens after that? Because the market and mechanism allows us to understand what is the demand curve. Who comes into the ecosystem? Who is creating value? Who is demanding this value? Then we do the token side, which is the supply curve to balance them up and find the equilibrium. But from what I understand I and mean, from all the projects I've been working with, it's quite theoretical. So how do we make it more practical? And this is the second part of this, this sharing I want to I want to I want to share here. Second part is understanding how does product design and business design, business model design come into play. And this is a bit strange to think about because I spoke, like I've been in this space for seven years. I've worked with a lot of, a lot of projects. I've worked from small startups, bootstrap to big enterprises, and they have a spin-off of an R&D lab trying to build and trying to tap on the web to be made. We work on a lot of different projects. One thing that I realize people don't really think about is what's your business model? Yes, you can have a token, but if your token exists just to raise funds, there will be, it's just pump, pump it nomics or Ponzi nomics. You're just going to pump it dump it because the, the investors, the, the economic agents are incentivized to do that, dump it, and then they leave the ecosystem. Or you use it as a marketing tool to do growth hacking for user acquisition, but there's no stickiness and no user retention, and this ecosystem all falls apart. So very important thing, to, you need to balance all three. Oh. Business model. Sorry. Did somebody say something? No. no. Okay, so you want I to think balance. We do have a things. question. Yeah, at some point, Lisa, like, please go on. But Vivek had a question in the chat. Okay, I'm just. I'll, I'll try to conclude this in about seven minutes, so we have a bit more time to talk and, and discuss a little bit more. I want this to be a bit more of a panel fireside chat. So, I want to. Understand. It's important to think about the business model. So, why people come to your ecosystem in the first place? What value do you provide to them that that someone else is not providing? This is important because we're talking about substitution effect. We're talking about games as well. A symphony, fantastic game, but there's a high substitution effect. And there's another thing, game that comes out, it's another game that provides more APY and tokens. People just naturally shift over that. This is not a business model. A business model where people come and go very easily. You have no, you don't have like your ARR or MRR, you don't have a, a solid group of base that is interacting with your ecosystem that's creating value. Monetary value or not does not matter, but creating value, this is a big, big problem. So we need to understand what the business model is, what the revenue stream is what the revenue stream is, we need to understand the product, and then we finally need to understand how tokens all come into play. And this is a, a triangle that we need to balance, and it's, you don't have to plan everything and design everything at once, again, because we're in a zero to one phase, but it's important to understand how three of them hit each other, or three of them align with each other. So I actually want to start with the product and business model perspective. And the first thing to think about is, who is the product or what is the product? I would say there are three ecosystems in the space. The first one is if the technology is the product, the infrastructure is the product. This is your layer one, your layer two, your ZK, maybe your, your, your DeFi, your DEXs, your lending borrowing. They're infrastructure and they are the product. People come to that and use the ecosystem and use the infrastructure because that's a product that uh, helps to solve that problem. The second one is a game. Talk about games just now. Games as an ecosystem, they provide entertainment and then you, you enjoy being part of the game, you enjoy playing the game. The third one are consumer-facing products. These, these are where, well, for better or for worse, um, the users are the product. How do you monetize the users? How do you engage the users? And how do you build an ecosystem for them? So it's important to firstly understand who your product is, 
of what the product is and then build a product, build the, the key principle of what the economy should be. When it comes to the infrastructure, you know, your layer ones, your layer twos, your ZK, your, your bridges, impo it's important for this to be easy to use and it's reliable. So your uptime is high and, and people can rely on, on it to, to do something because end of the day in infrastructure, it's the means to an end, an end to get something for you to make a trade, for you to do your transactions, it doesn't matter. You need to understand that, that reliability is key. For a game, it's sustainability. Nobody, like, you can spend a lot of time on games. I know when I was young, I spent a lot of time in front of the PlayStation just playing games the whole afternoon. My mom said, you need to go outside and go see the sunlight and touch grass because you need to stop playing the computer games. But computer games, spend, you spend a lot of time on computer games. So sustainability is key. If you, can, if you play to a certain level and then you stop playing and, and that's it, you just you can't continue anymore. It's not a very fun game. Sustainability is important from an economics perspective for games. And when it comes to consumer products, that's a whole new world we can talk about because different kind of consumer products. It could be um, a loyalty program. It could be an exercise product like Stefan. It could be any kind of ecosystem. Or it could be a product for you to engage with others and then a, a Pokemon Go that allows you to engage and go out outside and instead of collecting Pokemons, you collect coffee cups or collect Starbucks coffees and you engage with other people who also love Starbucks. So consumer-facing products have a, a, a whole new world to look at and a very different kind of business model. That being said, just understanding, having a very clear idea of what the product is and what the first principles are allows us to, to start thinking about the, the economics. So going back to, to what we talked about just now, now we know who the product is or what the product is. Then figure out who should come into this ecosystem, the market design. Who should be engaging in this ecosystem? If you're an infrastructure, so do I need validators involved? Do I need, do I need um, different kind of institutional infrastructure involved? If I'm, I'm, um, doing, I'm doing a bit torrent, but I put it on, and I'm putting on blockchain, and then the up, upstream and downstream will impact how, how efficient this ecosystem is, then these are my economic agents that I need to care about. And how do they interact? So I need to firstly, with that, I, I can define what the market structure is. Then I go into the mechanisms. What are the incentives or what are the behaviors we want them to do? What are good behaviors? What are bad behaviors? From there, we figure out what the incentives are. So as much as I want to say, this is the best idea of mechanism design, or this is the recipe book. These, you want to bake a cake, these are the ingredients you need. You want to make a hype economics, if you want to make um, a ponzi economics, these are the, the ingredients you need. There's no such thing because there's so many varying factors. But if you work from the end goal in mind, these are the, the behaviors I want to incentivize and disincentivize, then how do I build the mechanism towards that? And lastly, the tokens. When people interact with each other, what do they need to signal the value? Maybe we are in a trading ecosystem and it's a Facebook marketplace. I need to signal my reputation as a seller. Ratings are one thing. Could there be some form of soulbound token that connects my identity as I move from quick list to, to Facebook marketplace to, I don't know, so maybe Twitter marketplace someday down the line? And how do I connect that? So if, if this, this is the big goal that I want to think about, how do I, how do I, and, uh, how do I capture this intrinsic value into a token? How do I move it along this ecosystem that I want to build or different kind of partners that I have? So tradable tokens, non-tradable tokens, fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens, these are all things we think about. We talk about token design, it's not just, what is the token I need to, to sell to my, eco, my investors? No. When we think about tokens, we think about the supply and demand. Again, at the end of the day, that's like economics 101. The market, the, the activities we incentivize, the, the behaviors we incentivize and disincentivize, disincentivize, the drives the, the demand of the product we're talking about. Then we build the supply curve, we build the token curve to match that, that demand. And that's how we can get the demand and supply equivalent. And that is how we get from zero to one. I'm not saying you need to get everything down to a T, you don't need to get every single number, right? But you need to come with the concept that it's, this is real life. You can't just say, I'm going to be the best product in the world, everyone will just come. Life doesn't work like that. You need to understand what the demand is and you build a solution, you build a supply curve to meet that demand. That comes from a token design perspective, that also comes from a product design perspective. So with that, I'm just going to pause over here and, and I want to dive into questions and free flow conversations. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. We have about 20 minutes before Lisa has a hard stop. So like Vivek, I think you had, you had a question, right? Do you want to unmute? 
Sure. Yeah. Lisa, thank you so much for uh, continuing as well and joining us for Fireside. The question I had was just on compelling mechanisms. If you, know, you put all these pieces together, there's been uh, about, let's say, 10 years since Ethereum launched. Um, what are the most compelling mechanisms? Who are uh, examples that have have done well with low contrivance, high amount of truth, as Paul was talking about, and and more practically, just have elegant designs that you uh, think highly of? Very good question. And especially if I want to say, Ethereum has been around for like 10 years, the applications are still very, very new, and they're still quite baby. Ecosystems that has been around for a little bit more time will be your DeFi, right? Your Aave, your Maker, uh, your Uniswap. And we don't have enough data and timeline to, to show us how, how resilient these ecosystems are. And at the end of the day, I think the, the, question, is, the question we need to start asking ourselves as we're evaluating these ecosystems is how resilient they are. What is good and bad design? Good and bad, a good design is that it's resilient towards different kind of outcome changes. So i give you an example. I used to be a huge fan of Bangkok. I think they now rename it to Carbon because they failed a, a few times. But I love the, 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 the team, very, you know, very willing to take on experiments. They were creating this insurance ecosystem where you pull insurance together, you pull risk together, and you still enable the DEX trade to, to function with low impermanent loss and low price slippage. So they spent a lot of years working on it and it seems like a fantastic idea. And the insurance model was also very interesting. They used their own token as an insurance for this DEX model and they have different kind of pools aggregating all together. So from an academic perspective, which is what they did, academic perspective, you're stress testing, you're back testing, beautiful, like elegant design. Even the, the math was just honestly like, fucking beautiful. But reality is like different, right? Reality is that people understood how beautiful and elegant the design is. They started to look for plot holes in there and they just tag the plot holes and extract value that way. And that, that's the, at the end of the day, that, that's the truth, right? I, I put a framework instead of talking about a model because a model is something that's a little bit more fixed. A framework allows us to be a bit more flexible to understand how do we react to the current situation. Right now, we could have beautiful, elegant design. So like for games, big time was actually interesting because they didn't allocate any tokens to the investors or users. Allocation was 100% to, to the users. And then recently we have Pixelmon with their berries and their other token ecosystem, uh, the other tokens and exchange rate to facilitate a thriving ecosystem. So it's a very interesting mix of different mechanisms, very suitable for different business models, different ecosystems, different economies. And the important thing though, is it's not, it's not which ecosystem is best. It's number one, how resilient they are. And number two, how do we monitor and manage them to make sure that they continuously remain resilient? Because economic economic incentives that we're talking about right now is not fixed. The economic policies of Singapore 50 years ago is 100% different from what it is right now. And it will never be the same because the market structure changes. And that's why I want to use the framework instead, market mechanism token. And we talk about token design, we talk about changing the token economics or the mechanism. The most important thing is to understand how is the market changing? What is my user retention and user acquisition looking like? How are my users interacting with each other? Are my users taking equal taking the assets and then trading elsewhere? Are my eco it's my economic agents, it's my ecosystem trading more with each other. Why are they staying in this ecosystem? Is there a competitor coming up? Are they leaving? How is the changing nature of ecosystem, the changing nature of, of the distribution of users? Maybe initially you have a lot of investors, then you reduce your investors, you increase in the number of actual game players or increase in the number of liquidity providers. How does that change the dynamic of the activities or the, the actions that we want to incentivize and dis, in, disincentivize in the mechanism space? And then we can update the mechanism and then we can update the token. So I think it's important that, yes, as much as, sure, beautiful design, Aave at one point is beautiful. The Uniswap V3 model, also beautiful. Lots of beautiful, even synthetic back in 2020, beautiful design. But how do they evolve? How do they remain resilient in the changing market structure it's the key question to ask. How do I remain resilient in the changing economic structure or the changing market design structure? Thank you, Lisa. Um, like any any other questions for Lisa? Okay. 
people are still thinking. Yeah. Not uh, not. Oh. Yeah, guys, go ahead. Not maybe uh, like a question, but I was also wondering if you have, uh, or if you could elaborate also maybe your non-economic uh, incentives. Non-economic incentive. That's interesting. It's usually people structuring as a, a non-financial incentive, but non-economic incentive. I'll be honest with you. Economic runs my life. Everything I do is economics, but I love going to the supermarket because it's basically opportunity cost and economic trade off of what I want to buy so I can cook something tomorrow. So it'd be, it's quite challenging to think about a non economic incentive. And maybe I can, I can define that a little bit more. I think when whatever ecosystem that we go in, the most important thing we want to do is we want to signal ourselves, signal our preference. And so let's talk about governance, for example, right? Because governance is not exactly economic economics and it's not exactly tokens or, or pump economics, but or posinomics, but economic uh, governance is a very interesting topic on its own and, and you could spend hours talking about it. Governance is very interesting because it's in two folds. The first one is how do you how do you compare between short-term decision making and long-term decision making? And the other thing is how do you signal for preferences? And you know, I mean Aristotle was was uh, really no, not uh I think it's Aristotle. Uh, Plato, I think it's Plato. He really didn't like didn't like uh, demo democracy because it's it, it doesn't select for the right kind of knowledge or the right kind of people to be making decisions and making the right kind of decisions, especially in the long run. And that's one of the biggest problems with governance. How do you signal for preference? How do you signal for the right decisions? How do you signal for good faith discussions? How do you signal for for complex topics? But you have, and how do you, how do you signal for having a seat on the table for a wider variety of people so that the decisions we make might be hard decisions, but we cater to a variety, variety of people. And that's why I think governance tokens, for example, or even governance structures. How do you structure governance? How do you structure decision making? How do you structure good faith discussions? How do you select for, for um, long-term thinking versus short-term thinking? I'm not saying one is better than the other. I think it's just important for us to classify these things, for us to make a comparison, to make a discussion, to make an understanding or a judgment, to compare between both, to make to figure out what is the best decision at this moment for the community, this this term or long term. So, that is governance is one of those big big topics that I think we can spend a lot of time time on. And I don't think people take governance seriously enough. All they do is, oh, this governance is a token, uh, it's a, it's a governance token. Just buy the token. So like just. Just come in in the ideal, or just give us money in the pre seed round, and you get the tokens as a governance tokens. Happy days. But there's so much intrinsic value involved in making decisions, in the ability to make decisions. And the, the economic, the, I guess it's the non economic incentive because it's not financially related. It's how do you structure an ecosystem that allows for good faith discussion given different opposing thoughts? And how do you surface signals, especially from those with a software voice? I hope that answers your question. I'm sorry, I, I took a big round on that. No, no, thank you. It's uh, I, I totally agree on the governance part that I think it's oftentimes maybe overlooked a little bit. But yeah, thank you so much for elaborating. Thank you, Sahisa. I think JP, you had a question, right? Yeah. Um. How do you, when you are designing a system like this, uh, how do you balance the trade-off between the complexity of the design of the system and uh, the ease for it to be understood by the users? Like, um, yeah. Yes, love that question. And, you know, if you asked me this question five years ago or even three years ago, I would say, you know, let's let's build good systems. Let's build robust systems and um, resilient systems. They could be complex, but it doesn't matter. We're building for the greater good. And after I start working with projects in a more product design perspective, simple is good. TLDR simple is good. And how, what do I mean by that? Whether you use Instagram or TikTok or or Facebook these days, you know they have so many new features coming in. There's so many new parts to engage users, and they develop and grow as the users grow. Taking that to the economics perspective, we need to design our incentives. We need to customize our behaviors. We want to incentivize and disincentivize based on the market. When initially, we want to design like complex models, beautiful models, like you want to do all these agent-based Monte Carlo simulations. Love that, really love that. The problem is 
you can build all these based on assumptions, but there, there's also real users to engage with. Spend more time with users because users are the ones driving value creation. At the end of the day, it drives profit or loss, doesn't matter, but they drive value creation. And how do we design the product for the users? You can have the most beautiful, complex token design in the world. Nobody understands how to use it. Yeah, what are you doing? Like, what's the point of this? You're going to frame it up in a beautiful Excel model in your house or in a museum. Okay, people are just going to see that, but nobody's going to use that. End of the day, what are we doing? We're, we're here to build something better for tomorrow. That means people got to use the product so that tomorrow's, the future will be better than today. And how do we do that? How do we build that? We need to design with people. That's the most important thing. And by the way, I could be wrong, yeah? This space is still very new. So everything I told you is just my experience in the last seven, eight years so far. And I have not tested if they're, they're absolute truth or not. It's just based on my experience and how I've been working with projects. Well, thank you. Madam, I think you had a question. I did. Thank you, Sid. Um, Lisa, I so, so we talk about how like coordination and collaboration of resources is key to crypto economics. And, but I'm very curious, like, because I'm someone who doesn't come from a traditional economics background, um, I feel there definitely should be a lot of lessons that we can learn from how, like, the real world has played out. You know, there's so much that we take for granted being in this space, being able to just move everything and, like, design from zero. Um, like, what are some of the things you found that were useful? Because a lot of times people say, like, Web 2, and they're just like, oh, it's all bad, it's all evil, it's all top down. It's like, you know, economics is horrible. Like, everyone's incentive to be nasty, but it's like, how much of that is like normative economics? How much of this is positive economics? How much of this is just like a sad revelation of how we are as a, you know, like a large human condition? Um, and how much of that can we take away? So I guess it's like a nebulous question, but there was a part of me that was like thinking of going back to school and like studying economics to apply to crypto economics. And then I guess there's a part of me that's asking to see like how relevant would that be? Like, what are the lessons learned? And they're like, is it all bad? Very good question. And I, I like that, you know, we shouldn't be, we, it'd be good for us to not just be in a little echo chamber where, oh, Web3 is the holy grail of life and we should just all go into Web3. We have experimented and learned and felt so much as society. Look back into history, learn everything from there and improve the system that we're building today. And I love going back to Web2 and understanding what Web2 has done well and how can we use Web3 technology to reduce the problems or increase the benefits that be, that can be given to people. And like just going back to what you, you mentioned about, you know, going back to school again and understanding economics. I think at the end of the day, economics is a lot of common sense, right? It's it's supply and demand and understanding how do you how do you align incentives. And if, because people don't do things out of their good heart and goodwill. Yes, there are people like that, but the majority of the, the common man of the street is there's always an incentive behind. The incentive can be good, you know, I want to make the world better. Doesn't, and that, that is an okay incentive. But there's always an incentive to drive people, people's action. And at the end of the day, that's, that's what economics is, a lot of economics is about. So let's, and then you talk about how, you know, what can we take from Web 2 and apply it to Web 3. Web 2 has a very sophisticated understanding of user design, user experience, and product design. Like that is something that has been established since the dot com bubble and has gone down into a very, very scientific method. I like the word design because it's a mix of science, art, and science. We've gotten a lot of the science down. And I would love for you to go to school again and learn the science part. But I also say just go read some books, go watch some YouTube courses, join communities, talk to people about it, be curious, and then start applying the science to the art. Because the art part is absolutely key. We have nailed the science down in a lot of different ways of it. In fact, I was thinking about this like just last week. Engineering is something that a lot of people have studied. And, and good, like, keep studying engineering. The thing is with AI technology, it allows us to outsource a lot of engineering tools to machines. And so what do humans do? What are humans best at? Humans are best at designing, understanding what are the, connecting the intricacies or the different, uh, I think just now, Paul, you talk about sit, talking about, you know, secondary and tertiary impacts to any activities and actions and incentives we have in place. How do we think about, think in that direction? AI, engineering, it's a very great way when we have a structured process and ecosystem. It's a black box where it has structure and processes and ecosystem. 
all we need to do if, if, if our problem is how do I optimize given all the known parameters in history? Happy days, throw everything to AI. Fantastic, a fantastic tool for that. Do that. You know how to figure it out much better than us because humans, quite job. But if you're exploring a place, there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainties, a lot of understanding how do you navigate through these, these normative kind of understanding of this space that we are in. Humans are fantastic at that. And that is basically design, you know, life design, medical design, um, longevity design, graphic design, user design, human design, economy design, token design. These are where humans thrive at being. So how do we take the understanding of engineering and economics and, you know, the hard stuff? How do we apply in the soft side where humans are very, very good at and how we build strong and robust ecosystems for that? I think that's the humans. That's where humans are going to move towards. And that's where designers are going to move towards. And that's where humans can work with machines very well and do the better tomorrow. I hope that answers your question, madam. I hope I did not tend go off too tender. I hate people when they go off too tender and they answer the fucking question. Thank you. I think madam's emojis imply that you did answer her question. And Lisa, we know you only have three more minutes, so we want to be respectful of the time. So I would just close it out by like asking you, like in kernel, we do encourage the idea of like playing positive infinite sum games where the idea of the game is to keep playing and not to win. So like like in your experience, like how how do we do that? That's the question I've been trying to figure out for a majority of my life. And I've not figured that out yet. I think it comes in, re re realistically, it comes in four ways. The first one is a practitioner way. You need to just apply. You need to do experiments, see what works, what doesn't work, you learn from that. The second is once you do experiments, you need to start under collecting data and doing empirical understanding to figure out how do you measure that? You need to measure success, right? That's the thing I talked about initially. FDV, TVL, market cap, they're great, they're good measures, but they're not good enough for us to measure how well these ecosystems are created. We need things like the GDP to figure how things work. It's a whole different topic for a different day, but we need to be able to measure and then we can improve from that. So empirical, practical. The third one is academic. I'm a huge fan of academia. I know there's a lot of problems in the academia world, but that's where we can experiment with a different degree and we can try new experiments, new incentives, new mechanisms, be creative, and then implement it in the practitioner way. And number four is regulation. Regulation is coming in to protect users, not to stifle innovation, but to protect users. And lastly, which is something I've just thought about like in the last couple of weeks, is community. Exactly what Colonel is doing. Because yes, you get all these instructions and systems and infrastructure in place, but if you don't have the right people trying to push the world towards the right direction, then yeah, we should just keep consuming steaks and wear plastic and destroy the world. Thank you. Thank you. Paul says, how about the Gini coefficient for tokens? Yes, Gini coefficient. That's something I was, I was asking my team to look at. In fact, not Gini coefficient of tokens, it's Gini, Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient of wallets holding that, that token. We created that, that uh, measure in 2020 or 2021, or even 2022, I don't remember. But we're looking at that to measure inequality of users. There's quite a few problems with that, as much as you know, we're talking about you know, creating this, this thing. It's a good measure. It's not good. It's not perfect, but it's good enough for now. Ideally, I want to understand how do I divide users into different categories of users understanding what does retention look like, understanding what does acquisition look like, understanding what activities they behave, what, what value do they create, whether that value is a economic value like transaction fees earn or uh, intrinsic value generated by the ecosystem like engaging more with users to increase the retention of other people to build a community. doesn't matter, but everything's on chain, we can, we can understand that data. So understanding the category of users, what value they create and understanding how do they how does that value get contributed to this entire to the ecosystem that you're building so if you're a game the value creation will be very different versus um, an infrastructure versus uh, a consumer product like a loyalty points program probably they will they will differ a little bit so Gini coefficient good measure not good enough for us to make comparison good enough to understand if the ecosystem is inequal or not but can we make any economic changes to that I think we still need a little bit more uh, metrics in place. Thank you. 
thank you lisa so like i think it's time for like wrapping this up well like so paul and i will be here um to like discuss any more questions there are a few more questions in the chat but like we just all want to thank Lisa for being here and participating and contributing so well. And it is one of the things that Lisa and I have been discussing that we want more collaborative workshops in kernel around um, different topics, which are very practical and relevant to different ecosystems in Web3. So stay tuned for that. QZ, Lisa, QZ and I are planning something in that direction. So yeah, let's, let's thank Lisa once again. And yeah. Thank, Hope to see thank you, you everyone. Kind of. Yeah. Thank um, you. Thank you. Can you maybe share like the stuff that like my contact so that just in case if anybody mm -hmm. wants to get connect. Sure. Okay. Sure. Thank you guys. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So yeah, there were a few more questions in the chat. So firstly, it's top of the hour. So if someone wants to leave, please feel free to. But there were a few more questions. Like uh, I think Perv had a question which Vivek and Paul had responded to. Vivek, do you want to respond to the RV comment? Um, I could do that. I also wonder, Matt, if you'd be willing to share. I think it's a really important um point and donut economics is a cool resource to poke into yeah sure thank you um can everyone hear me yes we can yeah yeah i think it was fascinating because clearly uh, a fortune of um experience uh what he says a fortune of experience um but i think just to just to caution against seeing things purely through traditional economics because what we have here is a tool, a very powerful tool, and we're experimenting with very powerful technology. And the basis and the sort of models through which we build that is extremely important and will fuel uh, all of that. And so I think it's important to get that basis right, which has been difficult because traditional theories and models perpetuate themselves. Um, but one alternative model that has been proposed um, is one by uh, an e a economist by the name of Kate Raworth, who has uh, come up with this uh, model of uh, donut economics um, and Vivek sharing it over there. Um, but it's really a new way to think about economics in the 21st century. Um, and I think if we're able to build systems on a 21st century understanding of economics, that may be um, a better world uh, where we where we get to. So, yeah, Vivek, thanks for um, asking. It's um, it's it's very relevant too. I mean, one of the things that that Lisa is very very deep on is. Um, yeah, traditional economic structures and applying them within this new context. Where the modules tend to go is where it sounds like she's gone in the search of the question of uh, that Sid asked last about infinite games, which is what does it look like when um, you're trying to design infinite games? Uh, like, what is that? What is that reframing? Uh, require of you. And I think what Matt has referenced here is is a really nice look at some of those ideas of infinite games, the regenerative by design, distributed by design, growth agnostic is interesting. Um, and and yeah, the donut itself, it's just a nice thing to, to look at and to consider, um, which I've done with Matt, luckily, I think in one of the first convos we had. Um, the way it fits into the rest of kernel also for context is like you know this is module five it's on uh tokens and mechanism design the next few modules are on scaling principled games so scaling is a word that we play with but we we try to think about it in the context perhaps of of the donut that's here and then the last module is called the gift um and so the gift is is about the ways in which crypto uh, has the chance to have both a market-based impact, but also an impact on how we think about 
gifts and and like what does it mean to operate uh with with more balance between those two worlds um so anyways that's that's kind of where i see us trending with the modules themselves thank you vivek yeah i've just shared a few links in the chat which have helped me quite a lot and yeah, I just discovered new things in the syllabus, like new token case studies, tokenomics. So if that interests you, yeah, you can feel free to go through different token case studies, go through the DeFi library, which is another obscure portion of the kernel website. So yeah, there's a lot to learn when we start learning about tokens. Does anyone have anything for Paul? Paul, I would have the same question if no one else has any about like mechanisms that have been compelling to you. Same, same question really. Uh, minimum contrivance, most truth, uh, things that you want to tug on yourself. Sure, thank you, Vivek. Uh, I'm in the same boat as Lisa. Like uh, I've been looking at uh, these tokenomics, these uh, these systems. Frankly, I. I can't really find one in Web3 yet that is very, that, that, that runs very well. Uh, and because of that, I've been looking at other, like other places, like in terms of games, right? Because because my my background is in games. Some of the uh, games that I'm looking at are more on, like not in economics, like for example, board games. And uh, and something that we've been discussing are Jubentia uh, in, the, in the cozy game space as well. Uh, so I feel like, uh, but there is one thing I did want to share. Like uh, I, I, like there was a, there was a post by Veritasium on, on uh, like built that builds a little bit on on the trust game that uh, Nikki Case created, and in that video he he kind of shows how how like these trust networks become stronger and stronger as we build, uh, as we build more increasingly better connections around it. So I think that that might be like a a model on how we can build better infinite games is just strengthening the bonds between like uh, good actors and just trying to protect itself from the bad actors. I think it's at the end of the video, Vivek. Um, let me find it. Yeah. But yeah, but this is a very fascinating. Um, video that which builds on that first trust module and interviews the people who re did the research on on trust and on just how to build uh, better games or, or more uh how to explain it or or just uh, build games that last forever right like games where people can always participate in so that might be a uh, one way to look at but i haven't seen any web3 awesome. project that does it really well honestly yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Does anyone have any more comments to discuss? All right. Um, so I think we can wrap up the Zoom uh, room. If people want to discuss further, feel free to hang out in the Gather Kernel Cafe. Um, like, I think you have the link to that. I'll also drop a link in the chat. So feel free to hang out in the gather space. Thank you everyone for being here. I'll stop the recording and